You are listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is January 19, 2024. Our topic today is Core Curriculum over Atopic Dermatitis presented by Dr. Sosa Atta. He is an Allergy and Immunology Fellow at Children's Mercy Hospital. Common curriculum. Trying to click the next slide. Was it not? There we go. As you can see, um, this is something that we see a lot in our clinic, and we um, see a lot with dermatology. But I kind of wanted to just kind of hit hit on um, um, hit on um, atopic derm this morning. Uh, we talked uh, we talked about it at the the beginning of the year with Dr. Pena, but I know we haven't like kind of had like a lecture on it like kind of recently so i just kind of wanted to hit on it really quickly so intro atopic derm um most common um chronic inflammatory skin disease um you're usually going to see your pruritus which you start in infancy um usually presents with a dry skin eczematous lesions and your lichenification um you can also see your other ig type mediated symptoms um so we always see these kiddos a lot in the allergy clinic um a lot of those kids can have food allergies ar asthma um I know Dr. Am uses the word the atopic march uh, quite a bit. So, uh, epidemiology. Um, so, seen in approximately um, 10 to 30 percent of children, uh, 2 percent to 10 percent of adults in developed countries. Um, you have your three different subsets there that I kind of listed out. You have your early onset atopic derm between birth to two years old. Um, you have your late onset atopic derm kind of after puberty. Um, and then your senile onset atopic derm usually after the age of 60. Um, I did want to kind of make sure that. You know, well, man, so like if you have a patient that's coming in with atopic derm, that it's, you know, I'm like, that's an older, uh, you know, a patient population, like you always want to make sure we're thinking about other things. Uh, T cell lymphoma can actually kind of present um, with nuance at atopic derm, like in the older population, like that. Well, specifically, you always want to kind of think of like um, Cesare syndrome. Um, it's some, due to something you're going to uh, keep in the back of your mind. Um, um, I know that's like a border view question and like a question I'm kind of seeing like multiple times. So I did want to start that and just making sure that we are thinking of other things and that everything um, isn't just eczema. Mm. Uh, pathophys. So um, it's really characterized by epithelial barrier dysfunction. Uh, you can see some um, amino dysregulation between the epithelial, immunologic, and microbiome. Um, I kind of put all the big ones for the immune. Im um, immunologic like dysfunction um, you're having your increase of TSLP IL-33 um, IL-25 um, and so even me kind of mentioning those um, and so like you can see how you can have kind of have the overlap like with asthma um, and so like that is kind of at the very top of like you know on those charts and stuff that we kind of see like which is you know which is why we've been used like um, you know like which why you can even kind of use like um, test by or like in those like asthmatic patients, you know, um, because it kind of hits that first kind of barrier there. Um, so I did want to kind of just kind of like mention how like you can see the that overlap like in the um, immunologic um, dysfunction. Um, you can also have um, increased production of TH2 um, and TH22 cytokines and also <coughs> <coughs> Um, and also increased production of IL-31, which leads to that classic itch that you see in your atopic derm patients. Um, as I mentioned, skin barrier defects. I mean, so kind of the big ones that um, I was kind of seeing were um, the clotting gene, um, and that is one that um, is related to barrier dysfunction. Um, the big one that we are have probably heard since med school, residency, and still in um, fellowship is also like filagrin. Um, IL-4 um, um, IL and IL-13 is actually shown to downregulate the filagrin gene expression. Um, and also, um, it is noted that homozygous mutations um, in the flagrant gene can have early onset, severe, and, persi um, and persistent AD. Um, I know we hear about flagrant a lot, but I did want to also mention that there are some other genes that are associated with it. Um, also, there are some micro microbial um, abnormalities. Um, you can see a decrease or absence of your antimicrobial peptides, your human B defenses, and your human um, calcitonins. Um, and also, you can have your um, impaired signaling in your pattern record. Uh, pattern recognition receptor pathways. Um, I know we just had a um, big talk in um, immunology, you know, just the other day, I mean, kind of just about this. So, um, you know, talking about the uh, TLR. So this is also linked with atopic derm, um, as I've mentioned here. 
<laughs> um, so you can also have your T lymphocytes. You're going to see your CD3, CD4, um, CD, um, um, CD, um, CD45 RO, like memory T lymphocytes. Um, again, we're, you know, I mean, think of more as um, more T cells, like as opposed to B cells or anything like that. Um, you can also see Langerhans cells, um, kind of the buzzwords. Y'all like hear about those beer beer back like kind of granules like almost look like you know they almost look like the tennis racket um and these Langhorne cells express fc eps um dude express fc epsilon that bind ige um again um i think we all know that the fc like epsilon r1 like that's a high high affinity um ige like receptor um that we should all know um um also one thing that um, that was highlighted as FC epsilon on R1 on Langerhans cells lack the classic beta chain. Um, so that's um, so. So I think that's one thing that we definitely need to kind of keep in the back of our mind. Um, you can also see um, inflammatory d um, dendritic epidermal cells, and also um, our favorite thing in allergy, um, eosinophils. <clears throat> so diagnosis. Well, so it's actually a clinical diagnosis, um, and so we don't need a biopsy, um, and so like we don't need imaging. Um, sometimes we can use those other tools like to help us kind of tease out other things. I mean, so I, you know, I mean, as I kind of had mentioned earlier, that if you're seeing an an adult patient that um, has um, new onset AD, that's kind of like in that older, like a, you know, I'm an adult population, and so you know, you actually might want to go to go. To like a biopsy, just make sure that you're not missing anything else, and then to help you to narrow down your diagnosis, um, you always want to make sure that you got your diagnosis right, and then you're not missing something different. Um, but besides that, again, um, AD is a clinical diagnosis. Um, one thing that it is, you know, I mean, kind of different. So for infants, um, you're going to see your involvement of your extensor services, um, neck, trunk, and face. For adults, you, um, you're going to see more of your flexor surfaces. Um, the way that I was kind of thinking about that as I was kind of reading that is adults like to kind of to lift weights. Well, so you're going to see more of more of the flex, you know, I mean, the flexing surfaces. Um, and so adults like to flex. Um, and so that's one that, I'll, you know, that I was going to kind of take into memory. So that's one way that y'all can too. <laughs> Um, this was a uh, um, um, man. Like, it was actually like from a chart um, that was in metal tense. I'm um, kind of going over the major features, like in the minor features that you can see with uh, AD major. Again, it's an itching. Um, you're going to see your ex extensor involvement in your infants and children. Again, in your adults, you you know adults like to flex. Um, you're going to have your chronic and relapsing um, uh, chronic and relapsing dermatitis. Um, and also uh, and also. Uh, <coughs> Um, a personal or family history of um, AD. Um, minor features are going to be your xerosis, um, your non-specific dermatitis of your hands and feet. You um, can have some infections. Um, one thing is, you, um, you actually even have some um, eye issues. So, so an, um, anterior sub um, subcapsular cataracts. Um, as we all know, your elevated serum IgE levels, um, and also they can have um, positive immediate type allergy skin testing. Um, complications, man. So one thing that we see is infection, infection, infection. Um, I feel like that, um, like, you know, like we've all kind of seen it like in residency, but uh, you know, I mean the kiddos who come in with the, you know, uh, John, you know, Johnny or Sarah's a five-year-old who comes in with a history of eczema and now with the superimposed, um, bacterial infection and then you start treating them with IV antibiotics. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, you can see a lot of secondary infections, um, staff, um, Staph is always a big one that um, that is always mentioned, and herpes simplex is also like a big one that's always kind of mentioned. Um, you can also see um, um, AK, um, a AKC, um, also like a hand dermatitis, and just some other kind of secondary like complications that were also kind of mentioned. Um, triggers, uh, and so out, mental food is a big one. So you know, um, you know. And so I think we've all been in clinic where the mom comes in and they say, hey, and so I think my kid is, a, you know, like is allergic to like it's like some, you know, some some specific food because it kind of uh, uh, triggers their eczema. Um, and so like there is some truth that foods can definitely trigger eczema. Um, and so that is, you know, um, I'm mean, like that is different than what we kind of like consider the classic IgE type of food allergy, the hives, lip swelling, tongue swelling, difficulty breathing, vomiting. But again, um, foods can trigger your eczema. Um, and so probably 33% of, um, of infants and young and children with AD will show um, 
do watch you show clinical um relevant reactivity to a food um well so like of course like if you do like skin testing and if the food is positive and also like if you you know and also like if the family does notice that the kid kids excellent does get significantly worse with a specific food i mean so i think that's where you can kind of do the joint decision making where you can you know where you can consider taking out the food um but just also having that um conversation that if you take out the food they can eventually develop those those classic ig type mediated symptoms um of that specific food allergy um so a lot of joint decision making um and so i think this is one thing that we as allergists see quite often um in our clinic um, uh, um, another trigger is your, um, is your aero allergens. Um, and so the biggest one is you're going to see more of your perennial allergens, you know, like more of the dust mites, um, and more of the, um, more of the dust mites and more of like your cat and animal dander, dander. Um, I know usually you want to have, um, um, kiddos who kind of come in with like eczema, you know, and then parents who want like, you know, allergy testing. I, you know, I mean, I usually kind of just like go for the, um, you know, I try to get my bang like for my buck. So like I usually just tell them, you know, like these are the ones that we typically see. Um, I mean, if you want to do all the aero allergens, fine, but these are the ones that are typically going to trigger it. So I, so I usually just kind of test for like more of my dust mites, um, dust mites in my animals, um, kind of at this point. Um, and also trick, um, dude, and also like one trigger, um, is also um, like a bacterial trigger. You know, almost like Staph aureus. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, y'all, man, it's gotten too cold, and I don't know if I've gotten a little bit of a cold, like, on top of that. Um, treatment, um, so, biggest thing is cutaneous hydration, uh, um, and emollients. So, the atopic dry skin shows enhanced trans, um, trans epidermal water loss and reduced water binding capacity. Um, and so, um, and so, the, and so that's why we try to use a lot of, uh, lotions and cream, you know, I mean, to kind of, to help to keep the moisture in. Um, also, avoidance measures, um. Uh, Aero allergens, like, is one of those. And so, guys, I just mentioned, you know, like, if you, like, test for, um, you know, I mean, test for dust mites, we can, for, you know, we start thinking about, like, allergy, like, encasements, like, you're testing for dog and cat. Again, that's that joint decision making that, you know, um, like, you know, we're not telling you, like, to get a, you know, like, to get rid of your dog or cat, but just knowing that this could also be a trigger for the kiddo's eczema. <laughs> um... I feel like we've all seen a chart similar to this or like the same chart, but, you know, I just kind of knowing just the topical steroid list and knowing how to step up um, and, do, and also knowing like how we are stepping up. You know, a lot of these formulations are different, like whether it's a cream or an ointment. So just kind of making sure that we kind of are kind of aware like of this table. Um, I'm sure there's going to be some type of questions like, on, you know, I mean, on the board exam about like which one of these are medium, high, or low, um, and just, you know, and us, like, being familiar with it. Um, I know that I'm at the point where, like, in clinic where I still have to kind of look at this chart, but just, you know, but, you know, but probably knowing that before the boards are probably going to have to find a way to kind of, like, to memorize this, like, a little bit more, um, just for, like, a board question in general. <clears throat> Um, so I know we just mentioned the steroids, but there are also, you know, but there are also some topical steroid sparing agents. Um, well, um, um, you can use your, your topical calcineurin inhibitors, but so you can start that one at the age of two, um, um, and also your topical phosphodiesterase inhibitors, uh, which you can start, um, at greater than three months of age. So again, these are just options that you can use, like if parents don't, don't want to do a steroid, or if you want to add on therapy, um, like these are also definitely like some options for you also. Um, systemic medications, man. So like, this is the big one that I feel like that we all have kind of have moved towards to, but, um, dupilumab. Um, man, I feel like we should all know the mechanism of action right now, but it, um, you know, but it, you know, but it blocks the IL-4 receptor alpha, um, and, you know, and it ends up like, um, inhibiting, um, inhibiting what, you know, I'm in the signal of IL-4 and IL-13. Um, this is, you know, um, so you can have me use this like the age of six months. So, you know, I mean, if, you know, I'm going to, um, look, if you're getting to a point where you're using, you know, your topical steroids, you're using your, even your steroid, you know, I mean, your steroid sparing agents and the patients still aren't getting better. And so it's definitely something else that we can kind of jump to. Um, I did list some other alternatives. Um, and so there's some steroid sparing immunosuppressants 
oh yeah, I think that, sorry, I think that's that what say um cyclosporin, um or even like methotrexate. Um, I feel like these are like a bit like less like in flavor now now that we have like medications like dupelumab. Um, you also have your jack inhibitors. Um, and so I listed those there. Um, um, these are mostly you know I think like one of these like are like for greater than age. Uh, a 12 and above, but I think the other ones are more for like adults. Um, and these can, you know, and these can also like be options. Um, I feel like I haven't seen these being as used as dupilumab. I don't know, like if, you know, I mean, Dr. Miller, like a Dr. Algon, like if ever used a jack inhibitor, but I know like when I've done like private practice, you know, like electives, uh, then so a lot of drug companies like from these jack inhibitors come and, you know, um, and then say, you know, um, you know, I mean, to, to promote those drugs also. And so again, like it's another, you know, like, it, you know, like, it's another alternative. Um, I think that was kind of the one, you know, I think that's one good thing about eczema these days is there's actually a lot of different treatment modalities. Um, like, as far as avoidance measures, you, you know, you have your topical steroids, uh, you have your um, steroid sparing topical agents, um, and now we have our systemic medications um, that usually work pretty, pretty well. And prognosis, Mr. Khan, just to kind of end up with. Um, so the majority of patients with AD do usually improve with age. Um, about 30 patients will develop um, AR. 30% um, will develop asthma. Um, again, that's that atopic march that I kind of mentioned earlier. Um, um, a long-term study that evaluated patients with AD, like, um, do indicate that mild to moderate symptoms often persist for at least a decade or more. Um, 80% um, um, of these patients will need topical medication to control these symptoms. Um, and that is, um, and also these patients also would need to do those avoidance measures, you know, the fragrance-free soaps, creams, you know, like detergents, and so trying to like avoid like all of those um, triggers, you know, um, that I had kind of mentioned earlier. So that was pretty much it. And so again, like, I feel like I'm at the point, of, let's, you know, like, do let's try to hit all the high key points and stuff that we we kind of know for testing. Um, any type of questions for? Me?